Thanks, Joanne. I want to thank you, uh, the Philanthropy Roundtable and ACR, for asking Donors Trust to participate. Um, I'm going to cover five areas. First, I want to talk about what Donors Trust is, why donors choose to use Donors Trust, then go over the CAMP proposal, look at the rules that govern, govern payouts from private foundation, and then talk about what, from at least Donors Trust perspective, is wrong with the CAMP proposal as it applies to payouts from donor advised funds. Donors Trust is a national community foundation or a cause related donor advised fund sponsoring organization. Our community, rather than geographic, is philosophical in nature. Our primary program is the provision of donor advised funds for donors who share our mission. The central and animating purpose of Donors Trust is to protect charitable intent in support of liberty, in this case limited government, personal responsibility, and free enterprise. Because Donors Trust has a specific mission and serves, as a, a, and serves a specific community, we do and have turned down grant requests that fall outside our mission and purpose. In keeping with our commitment to protect account holders' charitable intent, we require DAF accounts to sunset within 25 years or so after the death of the original account holders. We will work with account holders and vary that time frame if they have a good reason, um, and we agree with it. Uh, consequentially, there are no perpetual accounts at Donors Trust. While we allow for successor advisors to administer an account during its sunset term, we generally don't allow successor advisors to name additional successor advisors. When the CAMP proposal came out, we did do a preliminary analysis to find out whether or not the majority of our accounts would be in compliance with the proposed five-year payout. And what we found is about 75% of the contributions to Donors Trust are paid out within the five years of receipt. However, some accounts here were specifically created with the intent of not being paid out until some future date. Uh, in 2013, our payout rate was 116%. The payout rate for this purpose was calculated as the total amounts granted out in 2013 divided by the average value of all of our accounts at the end of the year. So as you can see, we have a, a very high payout rate when calculated in this manner. Uh, a second payout ratio that we have is over the lifetime of Donors Trust. We've received $680 million into donor advised fund accounts, and we've granted out $564.5 million, basically an 83% lifetime payout ratio. So we don't view at least Donors Trust as having uh, an issue with respect to payout. We were established in 1999. And between Donors Trust and Donors Capital Fund, uh, Donors Capital Fund is a supporting organization of Donors Trust that also provides donor advised fund accounts. We've had 215 donor advised fund accounts opened. The median payout rate for these accounts is 92.4%. 164 of these accounts have cumulative payout rates of 50% or higher. For purposes of payout here, we're talking about total amounts paid out divided by amounts granted, in, uh, granted into the accounts. 27 of those accounts had payout rates of 100% or higher. How is that possible? Well, they were pretty lucky as far as investments went. So why do people uh, use Donors Trust? A driving factor is just the administrative ease. Rather than having to worry about a handful of gift receipts to turn over to the accountant at the end of the year, they have one gift receipt. Donors also don't have to worry about doing their own due diligence or worrying about the paperwork to process their grants because we serve as the central hub for that. They're going to, they receive quarterly reports that summarize their charitable giving, and they have online access to request grants and to see what's happening with their accounts. We also offer assistance to grant to donors and account advisors with choosing grantees. 
donors also use this because it gives them a chance to move from checkbook giving to strategic giving. We have a number of accounts that are opened up specifically with the idea that they want to accumulate a endowment that they can then use to give to charities that they want to have a higher impact with and greater influence with. Our donors do not view us as a useless middleman. Um, we offer valuable resources to our, do our donors. We simplify their charitable giving and we shield them from unwanted solicitation. And the primary thing we do is protect, our, protect the charitable intent of our donors. We ask for detailed mission statements so that we know what our donors hope to accomplish with their philanthropy. We require that our donors let us know who their sunset beneficiaries are, and we pledge to support their sunset plans and to monitor successor advisors and sunset beneficiaries for mission drift. So what is the CAMP proposal? Dave CAMP put out draft legislation entitled the Tax Reform Act of 2014. Section 5203 of the Act introduced new code section 4968, which require all DAF contributions to be distributed within a five years of receipt. Existing account balances would be treated as if contributed on December 31, 2014. It's generally effective for contributions made after December 31, 2014. So failure to meet the requirements to pay out within five years would result in the imposition of an excise tax equal to 20% of the amount contributed but not distributed within the applicable time frame. The 20% tax also applies for every year that there's a failure to make the distribution. So if you fail at the end of year five and still fail at the end of year six, you'd effectively have a 40% tax. The excise tax is imposed at the end of the level. That's important to keep in mind because if you were to make a distribution that was not a qualifying distribution, you would have no way of ever curing that. So in uh, perpetuity, the entity would be owing a 20% tax on that amount that failed to qualify as a eligible distribution. Distributions to other DAF accounts or to supporting organizations would not be considered a qualifying distribution. So I don't know about other people on the call, uh, but we receive a number of distributions from other donor advised funds that practice would pretty much come to an end if this proposal were passed as drafted. It also means you've locked your donors into the sponsoring organization where the DAF is first established. So if you have a donor who moves somewhere and you're a community-based, a geographic-based community foundation, and the donor wanted to move his funds to his new community, he effectively couldn't do that. DAFs are often considered an alternative to non-operating private foundations. The private foundations are also subject to minimum distribution rules, but the minimum distribution rule for a private foundation only requires a 5% payout based on the average monthly endowment. Payout, payouts in excess of 5% can be carried over into future years and count towards future years minimum required distributions. Failure to meet the minimum required payout at a private foundation results in a 30% tax on the amount that was not distributed in a timely manner. So if you compare the private foundation payout rules to the camp DAF payout rules, you see that the camp rules are much more complex. Individual contributions have to be tracked. The private foundation payout rule only requires 5% of the endowment value be paid out. CAMP rule requires 100% of each contribution be distributed within five years. The CAMP rule eliminates a permanent endowment for a DAF account. While this is not necessarily bad, it effectively destroys the use of a DAF account as a philanthropic platform and turns it into an enhanced charitable checkbook. Conversely, private foundation rules allow a permanent endowment. The 
private foundation payout rules are administratively much simpler. Private foundations can use any reasonable method to calculate average monthly value of their endowment. The CAMP rule imposes a complex requirement that every contribution to a DAF account be separately tracked and distributed within five years. So why is the DAF payout rule that much more stringent than the private foundation minimum required distribution rule? While it's true and it's argued that this is fair because the rules for deductions are better for contributions to DAFs, there are other platforms that have as favorable rules as donor advised funds that don't require payouts. Specifically, charitable remainder trusts that are properly structured don't have to make any distributions to charities for a life and being plus 20 years. So in and of itself, it's not a good reason to impose more stringent rules on DAFs. Arguably, DAFs democratize or pluralize philanthropy. DAF accounts provide a philanthropic platform to a broader group of philanthropists than the primary alternative, private foundations. DAF accounts can be established with, with a relatively minimal amount of startup capital, 10,000 in the case of Donors Trust, 5,000 for Fidelity Charitable, 25 in the case of Vanguard. The CAMP proposal restricts, if not eliminates, the choice of low-cost charitable administrative solutions. DAF accounts allow individuals to evolve from checkbook donors to thoughtful philanthropists. The CAMP proposal undermines, if not eliminates, the use of DAF accounts as a means of moving away from checkbook giving to strategic giving. Why favor the 1% who can arguably afford private foundations over other donors who can't? Finally, the DAF, uh, the CAMP proposal severely restricts the ability of donors to monitor for admission drift. Uh, you can't use a DAF account to protect charitable intent as effectively under the CAMP proposal. Another problem with the CAMP proposal is smaller DAF sponsoring organizations are put at a disadvantage compared with larger organizations. You know, it's a classic one size government solution. Larger DAF sponsoring organizations are in a smaller, a stronger position than smaller brethren because of the expense of complying with the proposal. It would be much easier for larger sponsoring organizations to absorb the cost. It's a classic Washington, D.C. Uh, pick of winners and losers. You know, private foundations are, are favored over DAF sponsoring organizations. Larger sponsoring organizations are favored over smaller sponsoring organizations. Similar philanthropic platforms are treated in a vastly different manner. Why are the rules on DAF accounts so much harsher than those imposed on private foundations? The rules on DAF accounts should arguably be less strenuous than those on private foundations. There's fewer entities for the Internal Revenue Service to police. There are a number of philanthropic platforms that allow for an immediate tax benefit without requiring the entire amount or even any amount be paid out within five years. Private foundations, charitable remainder trusts that are properly structured, charitable gift annuities, and university endowments. Based on this, we see no good reason for the payout rules imposed on DAP accounts to be more draconian than those imposed on private foundations. Of course, no one's ever successfully argued there's a consistent rhyme or reason to the Internal Revenue Code. Thank you so much, Jeff, and appreciate your perspective on this from Donors Trust. Uh, the uh, question and answer icon is up at the, left, the top left portion of your screen, and we encourage you to start submitting questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, if you've got any questions specifically for Jeff and Donors Trust based on that presentation, uh, submit them now before you forget them. So we'll hear next from Brent Christopher of the Community Foundation of Texas, which is in fact a place-based community foundation. Brent? Thanks, Joanne, and I'm glad to chime in alongside Jeff and uh, endorse what he has already offered and share a few perspectives myself then from a place-based community foundation. 
you know, with $320 billion plus in annual charitable giving in the United States each year, um, we have an amazingly generous country. Um, but even though the generosity is so amazing, the need is certainly still substantially greater. So when I look at donor advised funds, I really begin uh, with two premises. The first of those is that it's essential for all charitable dollars to be put to work. And secondly, we need more of those charitable dollars. Uh, there aren't enough to go around. So with that uh, set as the, the foundation for my perspectives on donor advised funds, what then makes a donor advised fund so particularly effective? Communities Foundation of Texas uh, is obviously a community foundation uh, in the state of Texas, but we are located in North Texas in the Dallas and Fort Worth area. We were founded 61 years ago in 1953 and now have grown to become one of the larger community foundations around the country. We've paid out more than $1.4 billion in charitable grants uh, over those years. And during that same time period, donor advised funds have certainly grown to be a really significant part of our foundation. There are around 600 donor advised funds today at Communities Foundation of Texas. They comprise about a third of our entire asset base and about half of all of our annual grant making, which is typically in the 80 to $100 million range a year. Um, so I want to share some perspectives from our own experiences here about um, what the magic is behind those donor advised funds that would definitely be affected by the current proposal that's in the CAMP bill. First, uh, to harken back to something Jeff already said, uh, it is not complicated to create a donor advised fund. The administration can be handled uh, really efficiently by the sponsoring organization to take advantage of economies of scale. And there's no need for additional accounting and legal work um, as you might have with other types of entities or organizations like a private foundation. So the simplicity also relates to the fact that they are typically less expensive. And those benefits really create two big results. First, there is ease of entry. And that ease of entry can be a gateway for larger giving later down the road. And secondly, less expense means that there's more leverage for the charitable dollars that are put into a donor advised fund, which is also important, especially hearkening back to the original premise that there aren't enough charitable dollars to go around today. As Jeff said, they do democratize uh, giving in a really powerful way. You know, donor advised funds range in size from $10,000 to $10 million, depending on the criteria for any particular sponsoring organization. So they are useful to a very broad range of donors of uh, varying capacities. They do help those donors to, to move beyond the kind of checkbook giving that Jeff described to bring some structure and discipline to that giving. Um, and checkbook giving you know, often tends to be purely responsive and peer-driven, but bringing structure and discipline to giving enables you to be more strategic and enables you to produce greater um, outcomes and have a greater impact through your charitable giving, things that we definitely want to encourage because without enough charitable dollars to go around, strategic giving, giving and leveraged giving is really important. Making this kind of a tool available to a broader range of people uh, is important in expanding that capacity across the United States. Third, Donor advised funds in our experience at CFT are often uh, multi-generational. You know, more and more donors are wanting to involve their children and or their grandchildren in their charitable giving. And a donor advised fund does allow you to provide kids with the responsibility for perhaps even their own grant making amount each year or to serve on a committee with other family members for making grant recommendations out of the fund. That's a great way to pass along those family values, but there are limits uh, on successor advisors. They will vary from sponsoring entity to sponsoring entity. Jeff described uh, the policies that donors choose. At CFT, we allow donors to have one generation of successor advisors uh, on a fund. And ultimately, if and when a fund is not completely spent down over its lifespan, it is going to get brought back into the discretionary grant making capacity of the sponsoring entity. For us here at Communities Foundation of Texas, uh, that's what we would do after that uh, first generation of successor advisors. We do see a growing interest among fund holders in multi-generational giving, and particularly among um, next generation donors that are coming along. They want a lot of hands-on involvement. Donor advised funds are a great, easy, less expensive way to help make that happen. 
Next, donor advised funds are also a really powerful way uh, to gift a broader range of assets to support the charitable passions and organizations that you care about. Um, community foundations in particular often work with a wide um, variety of non-cash assets that people want to give beyond just the, the usual cash or appreciated stock. I'll give you a great example. No one has given us the Mona Lisa. Um, there might be some questions about that if someone tried. But we have had uh, gifts of fine art before. And I'll give you a great example. There was a couple here in Texas who bought uh, two Joan Mitchell paintings. Those are contemporary uh, paintings back in 1981. And through an insurance reappraisal, they discovered that the value of those paintings had increased by 50 times over the original prices. And so suddenly keeping those paintings on their wall was less compelling than the grant making potential that was represented by the paintings. So they donated them to a donor advised fund here. Now that was an unrelated uh, use so that their deduction was limited to the cost basis in the paintings. But we were able to sell the paintings in New York at, at Sotheby's in the fall contemporary art auction for a good price. And those donors were not taxed on the capital gain which resulted in the full market value of the paintings coming into their donor advised fund. Now those proceeds are being used uh, to fund charitable grants that support the nonprofits that those donors care about um, for a long time yet to come because they sold for a really significant amount. Whether it is appreciated fine art or real estate or partnership interests or all kinds of other um, more uh, non-traditional, non-cash assets, donor advised funds at a community foundation give you the opportunity to more conveniently and easily work with those assets. Time to think is critically important. Um, and sometimes five years uh, may not be enough. Uh, it takes a while to align your grant making interests with the needs of the community that you want to support. And donor advised funds at community foundations certainly allow that. You also get the benefit of working with staff around you as you think uh, to make the smartest grants possible. You know, we, we had a donor here who recommended a grant out of a donor advised fund to a veterans charity in response to a direct mail solicitation. And if he had only been working out of his checkbook, he really would have written that check in response to the direct mail solicitation and that would have been it. But we were unfamiliar with the charity and did some extra due diligence and we learned that the vast majority of their revenue actually went to fund their overhead costs without funding any program services. And so we collaborated with the donor over time, learned more about why he had recommended that grant and what he was really wanting to accomplish. And we could come back and recommend some different organizations and make other suggestions for the types of organizations that would carry out his, um, his vision for what his philanthropy could accomplish. And ultimately, we created a win-win situation with him recommending a grant to a different organization that's very effective and he was very satisfied with. That leads me into oversight. So um, the sponsoring entity provides a great deal of uh, both accountability and oversight around how these donor advised funds work. And having that administrative and compliance support by a knowledgeable team regarding the grant making rules and how those assets are managed is an extraordinary advantage um, and certainly one that would not be available to people who couldn't otherwise afford to create a private foundation and had no alternative uh, to a donor advised fund. We also do watch for inactive funds and, and we're constantly working to engage donors in learning about community needs and grant making opportunities as a part of that oversight and donor engagement too in the administration of donor advised funds through the system that is in place at a community foundation. It is important uh, for donors to have the option to select the horizon preference that's the best fit for them. So people can spend out now for immediate needs or um, they can create an endowment to support the community for years to come. Often that's a generational preference. You know, younger donors tend to be more willing to spend down now and older donors tend to be uh, more interested in preserving resources for the long term. But community foundations can work with both those types of donors around their preferences. Um, and we're often a choice that they make because they have close connections with a particular community where they live or where they grew up and they want to stay connected by basically creating community endowment through their own philanthropy and a donor advised fund at a community foundation allows that to happen. Finally, the last uh, big attribute of donor advised funds in my mind is that they help to underwrite the community engagement that we do through community um, foundations. Now all the sponsoring entities for donor advised funds are 501c3 public charities in our own right. Um, 
at CFT, the market value of the assets in our donor advised funds financially support our operating budget each year um, because our operating revenue is mostly generated as a fee that's charged on the fair market value of the assets. So that revenue pays the light bill, but it's also used for funding important work of the community foundation that otherwise generates no revenue, like uh, community education and engagement on important issues, um, one of which you see in this photograph here with the mayor of Dallas talking with a group of community leaders about um, building financial stability for low-income working families. So what are the challenges then of a mandatory five-year payout in addition to the things uh, already highlighted by Jeff? You know, I spend a lot of time talking with donors and potential donors, and many of them really appreciate the ability to capitalize on a liquidity event and give a much bigger gift in a year than they're normally used to giving or having the option to involve their family over time and being thoughtful about planning for future grants and being able to meet future uh, community needs over the long term. Unequivocally, the perception of government control over how and when they recommend grants is perceived to be a disincentive to giving, a disincentive to putting more assets aside for charitable purposes. Reasonable options give them flexibility, and flexibility is very important to the utility of donor advised funds. Flexibility really generates maximum generosity, which equates to more giving, which equates to more public good. And that's really at the heart of where the challenges lie with the proposal that Chairman Camp has made. Now I'll close with this, um, and I certainly can't speak for the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, but I assume, of course, that the answer is that he does not hate uh, Mark Zuckerberg. But Howard Husak asked that question because the Facebook founder and his wife gave more than a billion dollars last year to their donor advised fund at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation versus creating a private foundation like uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example. Now we work with the Gates Foundation at CFT and that's a great foundation. Um, and Bill and Melinda Gates are committed to spending down their private foundation during their lifetimes, but certainly not in just five years. So you have to ask, would Mark Zuckerberg and Priscilla Chan have put aside a billion dollars into their donor advised fund if they were required to spend down in five years? Likely not. They did exactly what we find many, many donors wanting to do. They capitalized on a liquidity event to give a much larger gift than their routine giving, created the possibility of involving their family over time so that they could be thoughtful about planning for future grants and have resources for addressing future community needs. Donor advised funds make that possible simply and efficiently for any size of donor. And that's the magic of donor advised funds. Joanne, back to you. Well, thank you so much, Brent. Um, and a reminder again, uh, we, we're getting some questions in the queue, so if you are interested in asking a question, uh, use the uh, Q&A icon on the top left corner of your screen. Uh, we're going to turn now to Ben Peirce, who will discuss the work of the Vanguard Charitable Endowment Program. Ben. Thank you very much, and thanks to ACR, the Alliance for Charitable Reform, for this opportunity. Um, I don't think I've got anything to say. Brent and Jeff said it all. Um, only kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, but they said a lot, and I really appreciate their comments, and it's a pleasure to team with them uh, for this conversation in philanthropy. Uh, thanks to the audience who are participating, who are anxious to learn a little bit more about donor-advised funds. Uh, it's really important that people do learn about donor-advised funds, and so thanks to all of you. Vanguard Charitable's approach is to be educational, hopefully engaging, and very open and very transparent. So I encourage any questions. If you've got any for uh, me in particular, get them out there and I'll try to answer them. Uh, we at Vanguard Charitable embrace conversation. Uh, we believe uh, conversation leads to understanding, that leads to trust, that leads to giving, and that leads to a better American society. And that's what we're all about. So to start, um, here's a, a quote from President Kennedy. Uh, I think many of us would agree with it. I disagree kind of with the last word, uh, tradition. Uh, I'd say more that philanthropy in America is really a part of our national genome. It's really uh, a, a part of us. And in this depiction, a very simplistic depiction, it, it melds society family and our economy together. I think many of us are aware that um, the world of philanthropy uh, uh, 
supports about 10% of the American uh, labor force in terms of jobs. It represents about 2% of the gross domestic product of the United States. That's, that's a wonderful number, but what's kind of sad about that 2% number is that number is virtually unchanged for the last generation. And that's hopefully what we're all about, is trying to raise all boats so that more money goes to philanthropy and charity becomes a larger part of our gross domestic product. Uh, in terms of the uh, historical um, uh, evolution of charitable giving, again, many of us will be familiar with this. I just point out a couple of dates on here related to donor advised funds. 1930s, the community foundation world uh, was the beginning of donor advised funds and thank goodness for their creativity and innovation at that time. Nearly 85 years ago, key point, donor advised funds have been around a long time. Move up to um, the 1990s, national donor advised come, uh, funds come along, not always popularly received, I acknowledge, uh, but hopefully over the years, uh, we've, we've been able to raise all boats in the donor advised fund world. And then to the 2000s. Uh, 2006, the Pension Protection Act, very important as it included, it, it included uh, a legal definition in the tax code of donor advised funds which had been long sought and finally arrived. So the history is long on donor advised funds. The, um, we've, um, uh, Brent and, and Jeff have been through the Tax Reform Act uh, uh, already, so I won't repeat it, uh, particularly the donor advised fund piece. As we know, there are other proposals in that uh, camp uh, language. I, I will uh, acknowledge that um, I think uh, Camp and his uh, subcommittee uh, did the uh, American public a great service. I, give, I have a great deal of respect for the hard work they put in to try to tackle an almost intractable problem in America, which is the American tax code. And so kudos to them for doing it and to the technicians who really work behind the scenes to try to address things. So I don't have any problem with the fact that they put out a whole lot of proposals and that's what they are. And I think this conversation and others around donor advised funds are a natural byproduct of this uh, set of proposals and it's going to turn, turn out to be a very effective thing. The, uh, the next piece I want to go to is really to switch to just to give everybody a sense of donor advised funds today after 85 years of use. Here are various charitable giving vehicles. Note on the left, donor advised funds, over 200,000 individual families have donor advised accounts. We at Vanguard Charitable actually call them philanthropic accounts. But look at the independent foundation column, two to the right, 77,000. Donor advised funds number two and a half times the number of family foundations that are in America today. Quite striking, fastest growing giving vehicle in America, largely for a lot of the attributes that Brent talked about later. I'm going to get to the why question here in just a minute also. But that shows the, the fast growth of donor advised funds. This is a separate chart that indicates the asset growth in donor advised funds essentially over the last almost 25 years. And what, if you read the chart carefully, it would estimate that at the end of calendar year 2013, there was about $55 billion in donor advised funds in assets in those almost uh, more than 200,000 accounts. That's compared, again, to the 77,000 family foundations and probably 700 billion in assets. The other takeaway on this slide is to note the variety of different sponsors of donor advised funds, national programs, community foundations, federations, educational institutions, all sizes, all parts of the countries, different missions varying greatly, but it's a real part of American society today. I'm um, not going to spend any real time on this. Uh, most of you are familiar uh, with how a donor advised fund works. A donor gives, gets a deduction, sets up an account, names the account, uh, suggests how those monies get invested, becomes the account advisor, recommends um, grants to go to 501c3s, in our case c3s only, anywhere in the country, um, and then establishes a legacy 
uh, for that account for after the uh, donor's death. In our case, we do have five different legacy choices, and we think there is good reason to have choice in, in those succession plans. The why question. This to me uh, goes hand in hand with Brent's great points about some of those attributes of donor advised funds, flexibility, simplicity, anonymity, all those types of things. But these are seven reasons why we have found donors really like donor advised funds. One, you can, uh, a donor can support operations of uh, his or her favorite charities so easily, multiple charities, for general operating purposes purposes out of a donor advised fund. Two, it, I think uh, Brent and Jeff Book may both have alluded to this, it's a great family vehicle. Sit around the Thanksgiving table uh, multiple generations together and talk about how your donor advised fund might be used. Three, for that one time event, you may want to build a hospital. We have a donor who's building an account to build a hospital. Is that a bad thing? I don't think so or it could be to create a scholarship program or to create a special program. But there are good reasons to, to enable donors to build kitties of money to have a big impact. Uh, fourth, uh, great alternative to a foundation. Simpler, more effective, less costly, uh, all sorts of reasons that um, people who don't have the money to be Bill and Melinda Gates who can create a donor advised fund instead. Uh, creating, uh, using a donor advised fund to uh, carry on one's philanthropy into retirement, into one's later years in life. Very powerful. Fund it while you're, you've got a good income stream and you're supporting charities in those good income stream years and put monies into a DAF so you can be philanthropic in retirement. Creating memorials for loved ones, creating legacies to pass on for generations to come. Lots, seven really solid reasons why donor advised funds can be helpful to various folks. Um, just some quick numbers. You can look at the charts. This just, just depicts kind of Vanguard Charitable's growth and assets and then number of accounts. We are very grateful for the trust of many people uh, across, the, uh, across the country for supporting charity through us. Um, the next page will really get to the grant making. Uh, this in the blue bars uh, shows the number of, uh, um, I guess, the number of uh, accounts, a number of grants that we made, over 50,000 grants uh, in this current fiscal year, and we'll give away somewhere around $600 million uh, via the 10,000 accounts that have been so generous. And then um, an interesting chart here where the money comes from in the Vanguard Charitable, largely through appreciated securities, but interestingly, a fair amount of cash that are coming off of kind of one-time income events. And then on the right-hand side, where we're distributing the money to. Not the traditional American distribution pattern, as religion isn't quite as large a component as it is in the national figures. Uh, a couple of very important things I want to just stress here uh, quickly is that um, in, with the charities that we work with and what we found in my travels and in meeting with charities, I've made it a point to make sure the charities realize that donor advised funds are a ready-made source of, um, of uh, cultivation opportunities for them. When they, get, um, when they get a grant from us, they should immediately realize that uh, there is a donor advised account fund balance behind uh, the grant that came from, from us, and they should be cultivating those, those donors for, um, uh, for additional uh, annual gifts, major gifts, and endowed gifts. Now, my apologies, but um, we've had a little technical glitch on our end as our screen has gone out so we cannot see the pages. But what I'm going to ask to do um, is to move on to um, uh, our, our payout. Um, that we have several other uh, charts around um, uh, well, we've just been where from and where to. So the final chart really gets to, <laughs> and it's kind of the crux of the matter around the CAMP proposal, um, are, are the payout requirements. Uh, national programs, Vanguard Charitable included, do have two specific payout requirements that we have represented to the IRS we will meet. 
so it's not that donor advised funds don't have payout requirements. In fact, national programs have two. Vanguard Charitable has two. One's in aggregate. We are required, we represent it to the IRS, and we've been fulfilling this, that we would pay out at least 5% of our most current five fiscal year end average assets uh, to charity. Um, and so that's the aggregate payout requirement. And we have a second payout requirement, which is every single uh, don individual donor advised account must make uh, some granting activity. Um, okay, hopefully we've got the chart back now. Um, some uh, payout requirement every seven years. So every count has to be, uh, be active in a seven year time period. So the, uh, the last, uh, so in fact there are two payout requirements and the last chart I would conclude with, if we can get to it, is a, is a bar chart that just shows how Vanguard Charitable is doing on its five-year requirement that the IRS agreed with. Um, and it will show that over the last five fiscal years, on that fi average five-year payout requirement, we're paying out 26%, 28%, 25%, 22%, and 20%. A remarkably strong payout requirement. So to conclude, Joanne, I guess I would mirror Jeff, why fix something that's not broken? I would add on, why change something that is working? And I think I would also just point back to the private foundation requirements that were set up in the late 60s when uh, requirements were set, put in place around a required 5% payout from foundations. The intention was that that would be the floor for foundation payouts, and I think we would all recognize that's essentially become has become the ceiling. I would hate for that to happen to donor advised funds. Thanks so very much.